just at the stroke of midday here in Nigeria. Welcome to Lunchtime Politics. I'm Kyle Okikulu. We'll begin with our highlights. Federal government presses on with the trial of cryptocurrency platform Binance Holdings Limited and two of its executives for alleged tax evasion. And that's in spite of the escape of one of them, Dim and Jawala. Labour Party National Chairman Julius Aburi reportedly hospitalized following the fire incident at his home in Abuja, a situation which the party spokesperson described as an assassination attempt. And the military says Okwama is still a crime scene as it intensifies the search for those declared wanted in connection with the killing of soldiers in the community. Well, let's begin at the courts where the federal government has arraigned Binance Holdings Limited and two of its top officials, the Tigran Gambarian and the fleeing Nadim Anjawala on allegations bordering on tax evasion. The suspects were facing five count charge on money laundering and operating specialized businesses in Nigeria without a license are arraigned before Justice Emeka Mwite of the Federal High Court Abuja. Although the trial judge is not a vacation judge, the chief judge of the court, Justice John Saw, granted the fiat that Justice Mwete handled the case, be it a matter of dire national interest. One of the defendants, Mr. Gambarian, arrived at the court at about 9.15 a.m., while his colleague, Anjawala, is absent, as he is said to be on the run. Let's talk politics now. The Labour Party National Chairman, Julius Aburi, is said to be hospitalized following the fire that engulfed his Abuja residence, an incident which has been described as an assassination attempt. A statement by the Labour Party's National Publicity Secretary, Mr. Obi Arayfo, read in part that his residence was gutted by a mysterious fire which started a few minutes after 1 a.m. while Mr. Aburi and the members of his family were asleep. He added that a member of a family who narrated the incident uh, says the family was woken up by neighbors and security men living in the compound who raised the alarm. The entire family were trapped as Inferno had reached the staircase, making it impossible for Mr. Aburi and the family to escape. The statement reads on in a telephone conversation uh, with the spokesperson, Mr. Aburi, uh, was said to be in the hospital uh, getting some care. Well, this is a development story and we'll bring you more details as they come in. Now, the Nigerian army has been explaining why it has continued to deny access to Okwama community in Ogele South local government area of Delta State, where 17 of its personnel were killed on March the 14th. And according to the Chief Civil Military Affairs Major General Nasahari Ugbo, the community remains a crime scene and investigations continue on the matter. Uh, he was speaking during the first quarter media Nigerian Army Civil Military Corporation media chat in Asaba, the Delta State capital where he also confirmed that the detained traditional ruler of Ewo Kingdom, Clement Ikolo, is still being questioned. And the crime scene, it is being investigated. I, why can't, please let us just be patient. I don't think, I'm not sure, nobody has told me that the people there, they are not being fed. I was not there, I'm not sure, you were there, and those people that were there that are part of us, they have been buried. So there are investigations, and the community is helping the investigators. Arms ammunition, we are still searching for them. We've gotten some, but we've not gotten others. So the search is continuing. 
Well, let's get more on this situation and the larger security picture in Nigeria. We're joined uh, by a retired police DIG, Mr. Habila Joshek. He joins us live from our Abuja studio. Uh, good morning, or in this case, good afternoon. Welcome to Lunchtime Politics, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Well, we've been watching uh, the situation playing out in Okwama Delta State, and it's not even just with the military. Policemen were also caught uh, in the situation. We understand that the police is also investigating the killings, uh, and the, the, well, some of the officers were reported missing, and up to this point, they have not been accounted for. So it's a lot in the mix. Uh, we have the police uh, having its own investigations the military also doing its own investigation. And well, we've seen that the community uh, has been sort of locked down for weeks now. Uh, I wonder if you have any uh, insight into this by the way of an update, particularly this kind of security operation and what the MO usually is for the police and perhaps the military. Yes, um there are no information outside some of the things you've mentioned. But um, it's very unfortunate that um, not just the police and any, uh, any other security agencies, but the military, uh, who, should, who should at least be seen to be that kind of force that um, people don't dare anyhow. In other words, you remember too that uh, the major um, assignment or the major responsibility respons responsibilities of the military is also to fence uh, the outer uh, cordon of, of, of a country. And so they are more into, into ensuring that the citizens are safe and also that the country is not being invaded by whoever. And in other words, for the police and others who are in the internal security are those also that are always within. And so the military have this right because the military has the, the, the capacity, they, 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 have, they have the right to actually um, get to a place where they, they think that the safety of people and some uh, things that are happening uh, 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 need to be corrected. And that's why they went there. And so I, I, I haven't any other new development rather than, I think they said they are investigating and investigation sometimes could take long time. And so they should be able to give um, an opportunity for the, for the military to do their investigation because uh, you could see that the attack of the military was in such a way that with a lot of, with a lot of anger because um, not just that they were shot, but they were also, uh, some of their bodies were taken. And so uh, this is more than what one expect. And therefore, um, investigation has to, be, has to be conducted to know the sources of those arms, the reason for the kind of anger and the reason for that kind of um, attack uh, that, that brought these people down. So I, I think we, we, sh we should be able to, uh, to look at it as a very unfortunate incident and that um, the, 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 the investigation must go on so that the truth uh, be made public. So you look at the situation, six policemen killed in an ambush in Ohura Forest in Ugeli, uh, 17 officers and men of the army killed in uh, Okwama community. Uh, it, it, it's just, you know, it leaves a really bad taste in the mouth. But it's been said that the place remains a crime scene and the investigations will continue, understanding that people have been declared uh, wanted. But, you know, the situation in Ohoro Forest that involved the police, they were said to have been uh, ambushed uh, by terrorists, so to speak. And I recall that at that event, that civil military event, uh, it was also said that well, there shouldn't be too much attention given to terrorists because they thrive on attention, be it media or social media attention. And that has always been a classic debate. The need to definitely report these incidents. Imagine if the media did not report the killing of the soldiers or the policemen. Uh, that would definitely have been uh, a travesty of sorts. So how do we strike that balance, really? Not giving too much attention, but ensuring that those issues are reported at the same time. Yes, um, sometimes we won't understand, maybe because of our uh, inability to know exactly what it is. 
And um, they wouldn't want to say things that they've not confirmed. So I'm, I'm sure that whether it is the police or the military, uh, it could, um, I'm reporting it late, would be as a result of trying to find facts and state exactly what it is. But in other words, it's not a good uh, omen for this country that um, security agencies that have the responsibility of ensuring the safety of, of, of the citizen and the country are being attacked. And so we have to look at that and correct it. We have to ensure that those who did that must pay for it. Otherwise, um, uh, we're going to have more problems on our head. The police and the army would have something else if this is left without a thorough investigation and those responsible must be accountable. And they must, they must answer the, the, the consequences of, of some of this because this is a new trend uh, that cannot be allowed to rear its head. Um, well, my focus is on the reportage of terrorism, uh, this insecurity incident, particularly when it comes to terrorism. It was said at that event that uh, terrorists shouldn't be given too much media attention, uh, saying that they thrive on such attention and that helps them to even operate more, get attention and the rest. So my question is, how do we strike a balance between not giving too much attention to terrorism and terrorists uh, as against reporting these insecurity incidents. Uh, as a security operative, you've had years of experience in that area. Uh, what are some of the pros and cons of reportage, giving attention to terrorism? Okay. I, I, I agree with you that um, in all the experiences, um, we are trying to magnify this, we're trying to talk about it, we're trying to analyze this, and, and that's going to, to strengthen them because you could see that the kind of, um, the kind of anger or the kind of dislike that they had, that um, they have to mow down security agencies and the military, and not just that, but they were able to also even um, 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 try as much as possible to even remove some of the vital, um, some of the vital, vital uh, organs. This is this is this kind of this kind of anger is not allowed, and therefore we we should not continue to propagate this and make them look like heroes. Because the more you analyze this, and the more you talk about it and publish all this, they are going to be very 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 happy, and um, they will be encouraged to do more because they've done this. And so I think that um, investigation quietly, and then um, thereafter. Um, the outcome of the investigation can be made properly. But if we continue to talk about them, a lot of it will encourage them and they, they think they have what it takes to confront our security operators and the security officers and the men in this country. And so I think we should, we should, we should continue, we should, we should, we should um, distance ourselves from making a lot of, of, of uh, insinuation uh, this and that, and co making contribution to, to make them look like heroes, to make them look like people who can do more than what they've done. We shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't encourage that. Rather, we should discourage this kind of attitude of these people, not just bringing down the security agencies, but the military, and not only bringing them down, but, but try as much as possible to do beyond, beyond that. Uh, and so I, am, I, I flow with you that... Um, we, sh we, shouldn't, we shouldn't politicize this, and we should not also continue to discuss this. Uh, let the police and the army and whoever that um, this, the authority responsible for this should do a very good job, and all that are involved must account to it. Absolutely. So let's speak to some of the recent events we've uh, recorded, particularly kidnappings. I mean, those are stories we'll definitely report on and follow uh, them up. We've seen what played out in Kaduna. Thankfully, students were rescued. Even in Delta State, shocking enough, thankfully they were rescued as well. But we've seen what happened with the Unical students, three of them, and of late Ukari in Taraba State. I know there are different dynamics with these different um, areas. Uh, what might be obtainable in one place might not be obtainable in another. But the underlying theme is the fact that there is security breach or there are security breaches in all of these places. 
uh, it was muted recently that, oh, we'll have state police and hopefully when this happens, uh, we'll be able to tighten these loose ends even better. But that's not happening today, perhaps not tomorrow or in the coming weeks. So while we wait on that state police that has been described as a silver bullet, whether or not that's the case, the jury is out there. What are the things we need to tidy up to ensure that at least we put this kidnapping scourge on the check? Yes, it's, it's been very unfortunate. If, if we think that the solution is um, um, a quick one of um, trying to get the, the police um, in all the states, and then state police, um, already you are aware that all the governors are members of the Committee on Police at the federal level. Um, I would like to say this incident that has happened, we, we have to account to it, the members of the public, because walking into a school, walking into an environment, and bringing out people, forcing them out uh, in, in, by way of kidnapping them, it's also not good for the country. Because I believe that um, in, 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 in a school like the university or even the secondary school, people should be able to be security conscious. And when you see such people, there's, there are possibilities of you stopping them from doing that. But if they are able to pick this man, we should have other person who should send message to the, to the police and any other security agencies that this has happened in a community. By the time they move out of the environment to get to where they are. They are, they are, they are gotten. But um, it's unfortunate that once it happened, it will take some time before we know that something has happened. And so every citizen must ensure that he be the security of himself and for others. And so all these things that are happening, every individual, every citizen of this country must know that you have to create an eye that if there's something happening within your vicinity, you should be able to really um, know that and then, um, and, and, and then make a report. In other words, um, deployment of security agencies is not, is, not, is not quite adequate because you come in uh, to do a kidnap like the one in the school and the one in the communities. It is, it is not something that you just do within five minutes and you fly. It's something that you have to spend a lot of time. And sometimes they trek out. Sometimes the vehicles they carry also make um, a lot of people to understand that there's something happening. In other words, all communities, everyone in this community and every other person where you find yourself, you should create an, an, an eagle eye that whatever that is happening, you should be able to make a call and let the police or any security agencies know that there's something abnormal that is happening. Um, in doing that, it also means that the police and other security agencies must know their deployment, must make some change in their deployment. In other words, we used to have police post right down into the interior that you have very few police officers to observe and to encourage the people that if there's anything, they will be able to pick what it is and sent to the headquarters. We have a police force. We have a police station. We used to have a police station with few people also with some logistics that can respond. Before you get to where we have the divisional police officer, the area commander, and, 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 and talk of, of, of the headquarters. And so these things are not there. And so there's a lot of um, vacuum. There's a lot of, 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 of space that is not occupied. And so when crime are committed, like kidnapping, it takes a long time before it is reported. And so that makes it a little bit difficult for anybody to, to respond. And so we need to ensure that those things we do in those days, logistics for those rural areas, putting in the police station, police station, police post, and the police division. This will help a lot, because when you go in, to commit a crime, coming out might be difficult. And then uh, communication and, then, and, and logistic will help. If we don't right. do that, then there are issues. Mm. All right, let's, let's wind down on this. Um, 
So there's like a value chain of sorts, or just a chain. So there's the intelligence gathering. There's also, you know, getting communication. Maybe when an event or an incident happens, getting communication across to the police from the people or where the, uh, you know, the the incident is taking place. There's also the part of response. Response time has been a major issue, and I think you've spoken to some of these. And then there's the arrest, hopefully, and prosecution. Now, while we can break all of these you know, processes across the chain, we can break them down and take a look at the issues. One that has been a, a, a sore uh, point is the prosecution, uh, particularly of kidnappers. Some say we need to have stringent laws in place so that once anybody is caught and found guilty, there's a proper uh, you know, punishment meted out. The wife of the president had muted possible death sentence uh, for kidnappers. But from your experience, and I know you retired about four, four plus years ago, but from your experience, do you think this is feasible? And what are some of the hurdles you see, particularly the police crossing in a bid to properly prosecute kidnappers and get the right sentencing? Yeah, I, I align with, um, with Her Excellency uh, in making that because um, there are a lot of things to do to, to be able to, um, you know, um, take this matter to court and to stand to also argue and, and prove beyond doubt that um, there's, there's somebody has committed a crime. Evidence is quite available. Um, the truth also is that um, there's a, it, it, it's... Um, the process is long, and the process could, could continue to, uh, to stay. And it's very difficult for, the, for uh, police to prosecute these cases. There are other officers who started the case. And in the end, they, they won't be there um, at the time they are transferred. If they are transferred, and they're very, very far, uh, it becomes difficult for somebody that is posted to Lagos to come to Kano uh, to, keep, to, to, to give an evidence. Sometimes um, you are wanted at a time where it's difficult to do so. And so um, I think the, government, the laws should, 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 should be restudied and be given them a very, very um, encouraging way of, 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 of dealing with the issue. And, and, and the sentences and the punishment should, should be quite um, adequate enough to, to discourage people from going into kidnapping and into crime and crime, uh, criminality. Otherwise, I think there's a lot uh, to be done. If it, this is something that, that we also see in election. After election, there are election tribunal and what have you. To get the people who came for that election to come and testify becomes a problem. And so I think that um, there should be a way of, of government to strengthen this, uh, to ensure that um, uh, the judges um, you know, do um, their diligent um, prosecution um, so that we can have, you know, uh, a quick um, dispensation of justice. Otherwise, um, this thing is, is a big problem. So I agree with you that there's, there's a well, problem with the prosecution. There's a problem with timing. Well, you may be retired, but you definitely do not look tired. And I should just say retirement looks good on you. Uh, we're speaking with Mr. Abila Joshak, retired DIG of police. Thank you so much for your time on the show, sir. Thank you for having me. All right, let's come here to Lagos now. And we're talking infrastructure after weeks of repair works. And I should say, uh, lots of headache on the part of uh, commuters and vehicle users. The Third Mainland Bridge is being opened fully. Uh, just 12, actually. That was a time scheduled uh, for that. So it's been fully opened to vehicle movement. But we have our correspondent, Chris Alems, who is live at the bridge, joining us on the show uh, to bring us more. Chris Alems, I imagine Lagosians who have to use that route heaving a sigh of relief now that the Third Mainland Bridge uh, is opening. But speak to us uh, about what is going on there at the moment. I know you've been reporting on this uh, for the past few weeks, but give us the latest update, Chris. Now, as you can see behind me, they are about opening the bridge. And of course, uh, once that is done, commuters will be able to use the bridge, you know, to and through the island. And you know what that would mean. 
it would mean a reduction in gridlock on the Korodu Road. But I think I should just allow you to see the opening officially, and then we can talk uh, thereafter, because right now, the opening ceremony is uh, taking place on the Third Mainland Bridge. Well, there you see the bridge is actually about to be open now. It is 12.25 p.m. in Lagos, Niger's commercial capital. So 25 minutes actually behind shadow. So our correspondent Chris Lems ensuring that we get those live images. And there you see the bridge officially being opened any moment from now. Here, there seems to be a little bit of a uh, commotion uh, there. We'll let you see the live images, but uh, I will just speak over it. As you can expect, there's a lot of uh, excitement and energy around that place. This has been closed for quite some time now for a lot of people. <sighs> Finally, I imagine they're heaving a sigh of relief. So that's like the... Uh, I think imagine the Oroshoki uh, end of the uh, third mainland bridge. That's usually where you can divert uh, towards Oshodi. Uh, and there you have it, live images. You can see press men uh, crowded around uh, that area just to witness the full opening or reopening of the third mainland bridge, which has been uh, closed for repairs. Uh, for some time now. Well, the Lagos State uh, Traffic Management Agency uh, had said to commuters to always uh, keep to, to the speed limit on the Third Mainland Bridge. So the fact that the bridge looks good, the potholes are gone, the expansion joints are fixed, uh, it's not a license to overspeed. And I think that is a very, very important point to make. Uh, particularly for road users. Uh, quite interesting uh, to see images of the bridge, really, with the CCTVs and the solar lights uh, being installed on that bridge as well to ensure safety of the commuters and the infrastructure uh, itself. So, finally, it is happening. April the 4th, 2024, the third mainland bridge is being reopened fully to traffic for those who will be plying that route. So while we wait on that, let's bring you uh, an update on the court processes that concerns Binance Holdings Limited and two of, his, of its executives, one of them at large. We understand that the arraignment uh, has been stalled as the official who escaped from custody, Mr. Gambarian, uh, has not been served with uh, charge uh, by the FIRS, that's the Federal Inland Revenue uh, Service. So... Um, that is the update which we have for you uh, from uh, the courts concerning the arraignment of the Binance executives and uh, Binance Holdings uh, Limited. I should say the executive who actually eloped is Nadim Anjerwala is uh, on the run, we understand according to reports. So it is said that he has not been served uh, with the charge by the FIRS. And that's the program for this afternoon. Stay with Channels Television for all of the latest updates from Third Mainland Bridge, courts, the seat of power, and all across the country and the continent. I'm Kyle Thank you for watching. Goodbye.